a kind of a prideful knowledge. They don't ask questions. They don't humble themselves. They haven't had the judgments revealed. They are still living for themselves. The presumptuous sins, those scorner Christians who think that they know because they have a, a seminary certificate, okay? They're, they're graduated from a seminary school. So they think that they understand what's going on. So they write books, they preach, and so forth. But all the while, what? They don't know what's happening. Okay? Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression, because the great transgression is what? The failing in the faith of Jesus Christ. How much sore shall the punishment be for those who trod under the foot of the Son of Man and who fail in their Christian faith? Well, actually, that, that has to do more with the knowingly sinning, but the great transgression, I would say, would be the being a Christian, but dealing falsely in the covenant, which, as the scripture, as I believe, outlines, is what most what happens to most Christians because of their heart failing them for the things of courage that you need in order to depart from iniquity and to have an absolute moment of terror by which you truly come to trust the Lord. The Lord becomes your trust. The Spirit guides you because you have turned at her reproof. You have listened to her warnings and her punishment and stopped doing those things. And then when you stop doing it, even though you didn't know why, even though it didn't seem reasonable for you to be punished like that without warning, but because you turned, then she will pour out her Spirit unto you that you might know her words and then keep you from the presumptuous sin because you were also humbled by this process. And so you were humble in your way, unlike the scorner Christians who stand up on the pulpit and say that they have understanding and preach loud and preach very authoritatively, but they're presumptuous and they will commit the great transgression, which is dealing falsely in the covenant because they haven't been weeping upon their beds sore and broken. Okay, here in Psalm 21, and I was looking at this, and one of the codes that I have found here, it says, Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies, and thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Now, notice that you have hand, and then you have right hand. And I think that this is, when it says hand, it means the daughter of Jerusalem, Jerusalem above, and, and right hand means the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and who must be the Queen of Heaven. And we see that the hand is who is being talked about here in this whole of Psalms 21. The King shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation how greatly shall he rejoice. And I'm going to point out some of the, the codes that you will be able to match this with Psalm 45, which I also believe speaks of the princess of the Jews. And it says, Thou hast given him his heart's desire, and there's the him and the his, indicating a male and, and king. But I think that this is talking about the princess of the Jews. Okay, and I'll explain that. For thou prevent him with the blessings of goodness, thou set a crown of pure gold on his head. Okay, so there's a key word, gold. And set a crown of pure gold on his head. Could that be the color of the hair? He asked life of thee, and thou gave it to him, even length of days, forever and ever. His glory is great in thy salvation. Honor and majesty. Here's two more key words linking the person being spoken of here in Psalm 21 as the daughter of Jerusalem, the tower of the flock, the judge of Israel, as she shall be known, the first ruler of the everlasting kingdom of God, as Micah 4 and Isaiah 54 describe. 
His glory is great in thy salvation. Honor and majesty hast thou, hast thou laid upon him. Remember the honor and the majesty, those two codes. For thou hast made him the most blessed forever. Thou hast made him exceedingly glad with thy countenance. That also matches the thing, when I awake with thy countenance. You see, that's the female version of the waking with thy countenance. For the king trust in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High he shall not be moved. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies, and thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. Okay, and then the rest of this talks about how this person attacks the enemies of God, and they intended evil against thee. They imagined a mischievous device. And I think this might be the whole CERN thing, uh, possibly time travel, something or other, but they are not able to perform it. Okay, and there, therefore shalt thou make them turn back, when thou shalt make ready thine arrows. Another key word, matching it up with Psalm 45, talking about the princess of the Jews, who's dressed in gold, as you'll see from there. And be thou exalted, Lord, in thine own strength, so we will sing in thy praise and power. And I think that as, as much as it's difficult to understand why God would call him a he and a him and a king, we know also that this is that there's a precedent for this, because it also is written that David shall not want a man to sit upon the throne, and then it indicates that it is also the daughter of Jerusalem, the Omega of Christ, and arguably the fourth person of God, although I am not saying that it is the fourth person of God only because it, there is no indication of that in the scripture, and we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And the reason why the Holy Ghost is is the last in the list is because what men always come before women in the order, and they are not equal. The Father is superior to the Son. The Son is superior to the Holy Ghost, though that is his mother. And in Psalm 22:20, it says, Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Now, I remarked upon this because I think this phrase refers to what? The canines, the canine aliens. Not aliens really, but the uh, werewolves. This is the dog, from the power of the dog. And according to something that I heard is that these are, are very powerful sentient beings with lots of technology and all kinds of stuff. So this is um, interesting and then because it, because this is uh, this is all the power of the enemy. Uh, Luke 10, 10 18 it says that the serpents and the scorpions which are the reptilians and the insectoids uh, are are part of the power of the, the probably the main power of the enemy but it also says here Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. And I believe that these uh, dog creatures, these werewolves, are part of the beasts that God created. And they are very powerful, high-tech wielding aliens, as we would call them. But really, they are from the earth. It's just that they probably branched out into other parts of the universe. And it's been so long that they, when they came back, they seemed like aliens. But they were originally made from the earth in a similar way that Adam was and they were made well I, I can't be sure of it but it's but the scriptures does seem to indicate that they were made after Adam but then who knows maybe it's time travel or something else or maybe even just that time in the 6,000 years that they've been living off world and came back or they never left or they dwell within the earth and here the felines save me from the lion's mouth I don't think that, I think this might also mean because it's it, we, we got from the power of the dog we have the lions the the uh, the feline aliens the lionos lionos aliens okay now the connection between Psalm 21 and Psalm 45 
Notice here, Psalm 21, 5. His glory is great in thy salvation. Honor and majesty hast thou laid upon him. And then, here in Psalm 45, And in thy majesty ride prosperously. Notice the arrows. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. Notice the arrows. Ready thine arrows. You see, Psalm 21 and Psalm 45. His glory is great in thy salvation, honor and majesty hast thou laid upon him. Thou hast made him most blessed forever. Compare that to I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Okay. Another thing is this gladness and you'll notice that in the two things, there's two things. It says that also Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. And this gladness you'll see also connected with the princess of the Jews or the daughter of Jerusalem, the high tower, the first ruler of the everlasting kingdom before Jesus, her Lord, comes she is associated with glad and it's a coat with the oil of gladness above thy fellows you see that you see how you got the the, the gladness thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness therefore God thy God has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows you see she is being called God and is the daughter of the king. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in gold of Ophir. This means that the queen, the queen of Jerusalem, to be, will stand upon the powers of her mother, the right hand, the Holy Spirit, who will teach her terrible things, you see and thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. And it says here, you see, so shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. You see, this is God telling her that she needs to worship, and we know who, the, who her Lord is, Lord Jesus. But she is a part of him. She is the Omega. He is the Alpha, as I believe the scripture tells us.